Greetings, this is Greg. I decided to make a quick follow-up video regarding the reasoning for using an inverted V-type engine in an aircraft. I have another video on this subject. If you don't watch that one first, this one may not make a lot of sense. Link is in the description. There have been so many comments on my previous video that I decided the best way to address them was with a follow-up, so here goes. Let's start off with the fuel injection and carburetors. Quite a few people have suggested that the decision to use either fuel injection or carbs may have had an influence on the need to go with either an upright or inverted engine, and I understand why someone might think that. If you take a look at a typically configured automobile V8 engine, as shown here, you can see it's set up with the carburetor at the top in a downdraft configuration. You certainly can't flip this over and run it inverted, however, it's important to understand that downdraft carbs are not the only type. There are updrafts, side drafts, and more. So inverted engines could be and often were run with carbs. It's just not a limitation. In fact, they could even be run with downdraft carbs mounted at the back of the motor and manifolded to the cylinders. In fact, that's usually how it was done. Take a look at the carb location on this Allison and you can see that it really wouldn't matter in terms of carburation if the engine was flipped upside down. The carb could stay in the same orientation relative to the airframe, meaning right side up in the downdraft configuration, and the air-fuel mixture would still be pushed by the supercharger to its destination. The Ranger six-cylinder was inverted, and it used an upright carb, although I can't find a picture of the carb itself. In the case of the 109, some early prototypes were fitted with carbureted UMO 210s and later carbureted DB600s. Both of these were inverted V12s, so I just don't think there's any question that both carbs and fuel injection were both usable on inverted and upright engines. Thus, I don't think the decision to use carbs or fuel injection has any significant impact on which engine configuration to use. Next, we need to talk about machine guns that are mounted on or fire through the cowling. Call them cowl mounted, centerline mounted, or whatever. This has come up a lot, so let's take a look. I understand why someone might think this is related to the inverted design. In the case of the 109, the cowl mounted guns and inverted engine are distinctive features of the airplane. And generally speaking, Allied fighters on the Western Front used wing-mounted guns. So the 109 setup, when looked at from, say, about a 1942 or later U.S. or British point of view, might seem pretty unique. However, work on the 109 began in 1934. Before that, and after, cowl-mounted guns were not only common, they were the norm, and with all possible engine types. Starting with Roland Garros's plane in World War I, and for the rest of that war, Cowl-mounted machine guns were standard. It didn't matter if the plane had an upright V8, a rotary, or an inline six-cylinder. Things didn't change much in the 1920s. Generally speaking, fighters had guns that fired through the cowling, usually but not always mounted up high. In the 1920s, we started to see wing-mounted guns show up, but cowl-mounted was still the norm. This continued into the 1930s. Cowl-mounted guns remained the norm, and were sometimes supplemented by wing-mounted guns. In the U.S., the P-35 had cowl-mounted guns, so did the P-36 and many others. Sometimes, as with the Gloucester Gladiator shown here, a British airplane, they mounted them lower but still firing through the cowling and near the center line of the plane. In the case of this Japanese fighter, they have the guns mounted so low in the cowling they fire between the engine cylinders at about the 1 and 11 o'clock positions. The early US P-40s had two fifty calibers mounted in the cowl over its upright V-12, supplemented by thirty caliber wing guns. At this point, the P-40 has larger guns over its upright V-12 than the 109 has over its inverted engine. Newer versions of the P-40 switched to an all-wing-mounted 50 caliber setup, which was rapidly becoming the standard U.S. configuration, and that's a story for another time. Interestingly, the Soviets, with their P-40s, seemed to go the other direction, sometimes removing the wing-mounted guns and keeping the cowl-mounted guns. Speaking of the Soviets, they favored cowl guns, and they didn't use an inverted V-12. 
the Lavochkin LA-5, and I don't know if I'm saying that right, the Russians always correct me. Anyway, it mounted two 20 millimeter cannons above its radial engine. So from 1915 all the way to about 1940 and beyond, cowl mounted machine guns were extremely common on fighters with every possible type of engine, upright inline six cylinders and V12s, radials, rotaries, and of course, inverted V12s. I just don't see any way that the decision to use an inverted engine was due to the desire to mount machine guns in the upper fuselage or on the cowling. History shows us otherwise. Now, you can make the argument that with the inverted engine, the guns could be mounted a bit lower, but that's an argument for visibility, which I do think was a factor. Everything is a bit lower with the inverted engine, which I think was largely the point. So what about the cannon firing through the propeller hub? Again, it's just not limited to use with an inverted type. In fact, it doesn't really matter. The space in the middle of the V for the cannon's barrel is present, regardless of engine orientation. Other airplanes with upright V-12s have cannons that fire through the propeller hub. These include the French D-520 and the Yak-9. In the case of the 109, I have the impression that a lot of people think the cannon was mounted in the middle of the V and that the machine guns were over the engine. That's not quite true. Only the barrels are in those locations. The main portions of the gun are farther aft. This picture of the 109 with guns installed and no engine should do a good job of explaining this. As for ammunition, it's stored well aft of the engine and thus ammunition quantity is not affected by the decision to go with an inverted or an upright engine. Now quite a few people have pointed out the effect of an inverted engine on propeller height. This is a big factor in lower powered training and liaison type aircraft. That's because in these planes the propeller is directly driven by the crank and thus it's in line with the crankshaft. As an example, Take a look at this Volker D7 and note the location of the propeller when using its direct drive upright in line six cylinder. Now take a look at a replica used in the movie The Blue Max, which by the way is a fantastic movie. Notice it's using an inverted engine and thus the prop is higher because again it's also being driven not directly in line with the crankshaft. For this reason, Inverted engines were common on lower powered airplanes to increase prop clearance, but why not on fighters? Here's the reason. Higher powered planes need larger propellers, and you eventually run into an issue with propeller tip speeds, so you need a gear reduction to slow it down. For example, some Merlins use a 0.42 to 1 reduction, so that at 3000 engine RPM, the prop would only be turning 1260 RPM. With the Ranger six cylinder we showed earlier, if it's turning 2400 RPM, which it did do, its relatively small prop would also be turning 2400 RPM. The gear reduction mechanism, and I circled it here on the DB601, moves the prop back down, so no increase in prop clearance is going to happen. The actual position of the prop isn't really affected by the choice to use an inverted engine because in the case of an upright engine, the prop is moved up as a result of the gear reduction and in an inverted engine, it is typically moved down and both end up in about the same place. Radials also use gear reduction, but they're in line with the crank, which generally wasn't done with V12s. There is a reason for that having to do with optimal placement of the thrust center line. So I hope that clears up the most common questions that I see in the comments section on the other video. I just don't think the decisions were based on armament, ammunition capacity, or in the case of World War II fighters, prop clearance. I am still leaning towards visibility and maintenance. The more I think about it, the more I think maintenance was a big factor. Imagine you're working on the Eastern Front sometime in 1941 while it's raining or snowing. Imagine you have to change the spark plugs on a P-40. You're going to need a ladder, and you'll need to keep getting on and off that ladder to move it as you work your way around all 12 cylinders. Then, every time you drop a tool, or worse, you drop a nut or a bolt, and you car guys know what I'm talking about here, it's going to get stuck somewhere in the engine, and fishing it out will take time. Oh, and you're probably doing this at night. 
The 109 mechanic can do all of this with his feet on the ground, and if he drops something, it's far more likely to hit the ground rather than get stuck in the bowels of the engine. Plus, he doesn't need to go up and down a ladder every time he needs another tool, drop something, or just needs to move to another part of the engine. I think that from this perspective, the inverted design is a big help in actual frontline operations. That's all I have for now. I'm going to get back to work on finishing my P47 series, as well as my new 190 series and some other topics I have coming up, uh, P51 and 109 aerodynamics, as well as uh, another uh, muscle car automotive video. Anyhow, thanks for watching and goodbye for now. Have a good day.